Eric Arneson. Uh, I teach and work at George Washington University uh, down the road. I am the co-chair of this seminar, uh, and with me today is Philip Estrum, uh, who is the other co-chair of this seminar. Uh, Christian Osterman, the longtime founder uh, and co-director uh, of this uh, seminar, is on sabbatical uh, in Germany this term. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of the American Historical Association's National History Center uh, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and the History and Public Policy Program uh, in particular. We are dependent upon the generosity of a number of institutions for pulling this thing off. Uh, Schaefer, the Society of Historians of American Foreign Relations, is a longtime sponsor of this seminar, uh, as is the Department of History at the George Washington University. Uh, behind the scenes, uh, Amanda Perry of the National History Center uh, and Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center uh, work to make sure that these seminars come off without a hitch, uh, and we are completely and utterly dependent upon their labors uh, for our week after week of public programming. If I could just ask, as I do every week, if you've got one of these little devices in your pocket, and I know you do, if you would please take it out and put it on silent. We all know they all have a tendency to go off at the absolute wrong time. Uh, and so with that, uh, I am going to ask Philippa to introduce uh, today's speaker uh, and our subject. Thank you, Eric, and good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I'm delighted to introduce Ibrahim Kendi to you. He's a professor of history and international relations at uh, our American University, as well as the founding director of the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center at that institution. He has had numerous research fellowships and grants. He lectures very widely. He is the author, among other things, of a book entitled the Black Campus Movement, Black Students, and the Racial Reconstitution of Higher Education, 1965 to 1972. He has published essays in books and in academic journals. And he's the associate editor of Black Perspectives, which is an online platform for scholarship on black life and thought. He's currently working on his next book, how to be an anti-racist, and we will, of course, be talking with him today, or he will be talking with us today, about his stamp from the beginning, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America, which was the winner of the United States National Book Award for Nonfiction, as well as a number of other awards. But before I introduce him totally to you, I want to tell you that Professor Kennedy describes himself as a hardcore humanist who hopes, this is his words, not only for the day that the world will be ruled by the best of humanity, but for the perhaps only somewhat less important day when the New York Knicks win an NBA championship. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Kendi. <laughs> Thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a starving Knicks fan. Um, anybody who's friends with a a New York Knicks fan, you or is the New York Knicks fans here? I think you know a little bit what I'm talking about. Um, but it's truly an honor to be here. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you for this invitation. Uh, thank you all for for coming to to talk about uh, and listen and 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 dialogue about uh, this book uh, that I wrote entitled "Stamp from the Beginning." And, and so, what I'm going to do in the time that I have is clearly this this is a long history of, of racist ideas. It, it literally spans its entire history from 15th century Portugal to the present. And so clearly I can't narrate that history in, in, in the time allotted. But what I'd like to do is is share with you some of the overarching framework and frameworks that I use to write this history. And, and more or less the major sort of findings. So, so, so what did I realize from studying upwards of 500 years of, of, of racist ideas? First and foremost, as any, any of you would imagine, in studying this history, I, I quickly realized that no one in American history or even modern history has been willing to identify their ideas as racist. And I think we know a little bit about that today, right? And, and, and so, of course, uh, 
that necessitated a very deeply controversial thing to do from the start, which is very simply defining a racist idea, drawing that line in the stand between what is a racist idea and what is what I call an anti-racist idea. Uh, because I, as you'll see, sort of that is the dialectic, racist and anti-racist ideas, not necessarily racist and non-racist ideas, but racist and anti-racist ideas. And, and I also realized that really every group of people, every group of thinkers that I chronicled in this text define their own ideas outside of racism. And, and whether that's slaveholders, whether that's segregationists, whether that's assimilationists, uh, whether that is colon colonizers, so on and so forth, mass incarcerators, their ideas have consistently been defined outside of racism. And they've stated that their ideas are God's law, are science's law, are common sense, um, or are based on statistical analysis. And so I defined a racist idea very simply. as any idea that suggests a racial group is superior or inferior to another racial group in any way. So let me repeat that. Any idea that suggests a racial group is superior or inferior to another racial group in any way. And in contrast, anti -racist, an anti-racist idea is any idea that suggests the racial groups are, anybody want to take a guess? Equal. <laughs> so racist ideas express racial hierarchy. Anti-racist ideas express racial equality. There's no in-between between equality and hierarchy. And so that's what I'm talking about in terms of that's really the dialectic between racist and anti-racist ideas. Now, another key aspect of that definition, and I think that's one of the, and this aspect is probably what made the book a little bit longer, um, is, is, is what I mean by racial group. And so when I say racial group, I'm not just referring to, let's say, black people and white people. I'm also referring to black women. Black women are a racial group. I'm also referring to the black poor. The black poor are a racial group. Not to be, not to be uh, compared with the poor, right? Or the white poor, which is another racial group. There's a distinction when you say something that the black poor is lazy, you're saying something different than when you say the poor are lazy, right? You're racializing the sort of poor. Uh, and the same thing for black lesbians and gays. Uh, the same thing for the racialization of ethnicities. Um, and, and so as I started unpacking uh, this history, I realized that, there, that black people, and I say black people because this book is really a history of anti-black racist ideas, that black people are a collection of racial groups. And, and, and though that collection is differentiated by gender, by sexuality, by class, by ethnicity, by nationality, by even skin color, and so on and so forth. And I say this because each and every one of these racial groups have been targeted with racist ideas that are distinct. And so in other words, the racist ideas that I chronicle in the text about black women are distinct from the racist ideas that I chronicle in the text about black men, to give an example. Or the racist ideas about the black poor are different than the racist ideas about black elites. And the way this also works is because you begin to see the ways in which racist ideas have intersected with other forms of bigotry. And so intersectional theory, those of you who are familiar with black feminist intersectional theory, is critical in understanding the history of racist ideas. One of the ways we can understand this is that if you say, if you believe that black people are lazy, and you also believe that poor people are lazy, then when you put that together, you're going to believe that black poor people are lazier than white poor people. Or if you, let's say if you believe that real women are weak, and you also believe that black women are not really women, then what you, that intersection creates this idea that black women are strong, 
which means they're not really women. In contrast, white women are weak, which is what makes them women. And so this is, you know, these are the types of ideas and intersections that I chronicle in this text. So it's unbelievably difficult to understand the history of racist ideas without understanding the history of other forms of bigotry. So if you believe that black people are hypersexual, and you also believe that gays and lesbians are hypersexual, then that intersects to create this idea, as theorists have stated, that black gays and lesbians are more hypersexual than white gays and lesbians. And so that's just, you know, to give you a sense that, you know, I know it was a very simple definition. <laughs> any idea that suggests a racial group is superior or inferior to another racial group in any way, but it becomes quite sophisticated when we understand the vast number of racialized groups within the black race, let alone other races. And so the other aspect of the text um, is I began to see through studying this history that racist ideas and anti-racist ideas have fundamentally tried to answer a central question, a central question that has persisted over the course of American history. And that central question is very simple. Why do racial disparities exist and persist in American society? Why does racial inequality exist? Why does black slavery and white freedom exist? Why does Jim Crow segregation exist? Why is it that 40% of the incarcerated population in this country right now is black, even though black people represent 13% of the national population? Why do these disparities exist? And Americans have long argued over the answer. One group of Americans has stated that these inequities exist. Black people are on a lower end of these inequities because they're inferior. Another group of, of Americans have stated that black people are on the lower end of these inequities because of racial discrimination. And so that has been the central argument. Do these disparities exist because of racial hierarchy or because of racial discrimination? And Americans have been arguing that over the course of history. Racist ideas connoting racial hierarchy, anti-racist ideas expressing racial discrimination. Everybody sort of follow so far. So, so what becomes even more sophisticated though is that I actually found not one type, or I should say not one type of, of racist idea, but actually two types of racist ideas. And so really, this two-way debate between racist ideas and anti-racist ideas have in fact been a three-way debate between two kinds of racist ideas, constantly sort of challenging anti-racist ideas. So the way to understand these two kinds of, of, of racist ideas is to understand why people are saying black people are inferior. So Americans within the sort of community of racist ideas have been debating why black people are inferior. One group of Americans has stated that black people are inferior by nature. In other words, we're created unequal that black people are genetically inferior, they're permanently inferior. Another group of Americans have stated that the racial groups are created equal, that black people became inferior, that black people are inferior not by nature, but by nurture, that environment has actually led to black inferiority. And when I say environment, I'm talking about everything from what people consider pathological African or even African American culture to the environment of slavery has literally imbruted black people. So abolitionists made this case that slavery was literally making black people into brutes and that's why it's so horrible. It's making them into subhumans. And anti-racists were like, well it's one thing to say that an institution is dehumanizing, it's yet another thing to say it has actually dehumanized people, and that these actually, these people have remained human despite this dehumanizing situation. But that idea of, and this is a more progressive idea, that the environment of discrimination has created black inferiority has persisted to this day. After slavery ended, it was segregation 
is making black people inferior. After segregation, at least legally, ended, it became poverty and incarceration is making black people inferior, which is the dominant sort of idea today, that discrimination in the environment of discrimination or black people's inferior culture, this environment is making black people inferior. While segregationists have been like, no, it's not the environment, it's their racial nature. And so then, of course, anti-racists have stated, no, actually, black people are neither inferior by nature nor nurture. That black people are not just created equal, that black people are equal. So the distinction between all racial groups are created equal and all racial groups are equal is a very crucial one that I sort of chronicle uh, in this text. And so really that's been the sort of, this sort of three-way debate that I chronicle in, in Stanford in the beginning. And I should say one of the other ways we can understand this three-way debate is that really the assimilationist is almost like the moderate. <laughs> for the lack of a sort of better term, because one of the things assimilationists, as you could glean from my, my sort of description of them, is assimilationists have recognized the existence of discrimination. So they have simultaneously stated that black inferiority is both the result of discrimination and the behavioral cultural inferiority of black people, both. And they typically have stated that one has led to the other. While segregationists who have made the case of black, be, of the racial groups being created unequal, have stated that no, racial discrimination doesn't exist. We're in a post-racial society. This idea of a post-racial society is actually quite an old one. Because <laughs> really every racist idea has suggested that we, every racist idea I should say is like a post-racial idea turning heads away from discrimination and onto the inferiority of, of a particular racial group. And so segregationists have stated that no, racial discrimination is not partially the cause. The total cause of black inferiority is black people, is their behavior, is their racial nature. While anti-racists have stated that no, the reason why we have these disparities, again, is discrimination. So really, I chronicle this three-way debate over the course of, of, of American history. And I think one of the more interesting aspects of, of this history is you'll find that many people who I actually respect, and I'm sure you respect, many American icons Many American icons of racial progress have actually fallen into the assimilationist camp. Uh, I won't sort of <laughs> name names, because I want to encourage you to read the book. Uh, but that's one of the more interesting aspects of the text. And so I reorient some of their ideas as racist ideas, as assimilationist ideas. So I should also state that sort of that brings me to the principal, I think, historical finding of the text, uh, which I did not expect to find in, 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 in writing this history. I entered into this history of racist ideas expecting that I was going to sort of reinforce the common sort of origin story of racist ideas, the popular or origin story, a popular origin story that states that racist ideas have largely came out of ignorance and hate. In other words, those who historically have been producing racist ideas have produced them because they were ignorant of black, uh, black people or they hated black people. That was the cradle, their ignorance and hate. And so then that ignorance and hate led to them producing these racist ideas. And then because people had these racist ideas, that is why we've been told they instituted racist policies from slavery to mass incarceration. So in other words, the racist ideas came before the racist policies. Um, so that's the, anybody sort of heard that before? Ignorance and hate leading to racist ideas and racist ideas leading to racist policies. And that is why historically racial reformers have sought, have thought that education and persuasion is the principal tool that we should be utilizing to undermine 
racism. In other words, if racist ideas are causing the policies and ignorance and hate is causing the racist ideas, racial reformers have strategized, okay, you know what, the way we undermine racism, when we understand racism as this marriage of racist ideas and racist policies, the way we undermine racism is by teaching away ignorance and hate, by formulating love armies that conquer this hate. Uh, and, and, and so as a result, all of the major sort of reformist, racial reformist movement, education and persuading the masses of Americans has been central to their strategic aims, from the abolitionist movement to the civil rights movement, to a certain extent, to, to Black Lives Matter today. And so this is, of course, very critical, right? When we, under, when we have a theory on the origins of, of, of racist ideas, it therefore necessitates how we're going to challenge them. And so I thought that that was the case. Um, but as a scholar, I, of course, did not take it for granted. And I decided very early on to distinguish between the producers of racist ideas and the consumers of racist ideas. The producers of racist ideas, these, the people writing the novels that are being consumed by millions of Americans, like Thomas Dixon's sort of Reconstruction trilogy that imagined that the Ku Klux Klan saved the white South from the barbarism of black politicians. The people writing these novels, the people making the films, the people giving the political speeches, the scholars ascertaining, or I should say, unveiling scholarship that rules black people inferior, the producers of racist ideas, that, that I wanted to study these producers and, and very consciously distinguish them from the consumers. And, and then in, in sort of understanding that I wanted to study these producers, I wanted to ask a very central question. Why, was they, why were they producing those racist ideas at that time? What was the motive? Was it that they were just ignorant and hateful? What was the motive behind the production of their racist ideas? So to give an example, one of the more critical racist ideas in, in American history was the idea that slavery was a positive good. This idea was articulated not far from here by a U.S. senator from South Carolina by the name of John C. Calhoun on the floor of the Senate in 1837. And in particular, he challenged a Virginia senator who just claimed slavery was a necessary evil. So for those of you who aren't, aren't, aren't sort of familiar with slavery history, for early American history, or I should say early American history was largely that this concept of slavery as a necessary evil predominated. Uh, it was largely came out of the ideas of people like Thomas Jefferson. And but by, by the mid to 1830s, slaveholders were being faced with a growing abolitionist movement. In 1835, the newly formed American Anti-Slavery Society decided that they were going to use s some of the new developments in printing technology to print hundreds of thousands of documents showing the brutality of slavery. And they started mailing these pamphlets and these posters all over America, including into the South in 1835, which of course caused some slaveholders to think they literally were, were at war. Uh, but the key aspect of this strategy was to show Americans that slavery was not a necessary evil, but it was an unnecessary evil. Uh, and, and they largely, to a certain extent, began to succeed. So two years later, John C. Calhoun, seeing this resistance to this old pro-slavery theory, realized that, you know what, it no longer is holding the political weight that it used to. It no longer is basically uh, sort of justifying slavery in the way that it used to. So instead, we need a new theory. And that new theory became slavery as a positive good. And so he began to make this case. And a few years later, 
a Harvard, psychi Harvard trained psychiatrist by the name of Edward Jarvis decided that he was going to study the 1840 census, in particular, the data on people who were identified as insane. It was the first time the census takers actually categorized people by insanity. And so he started looking closely at this data, correlated it with race, and began finding that people were more likely to be insane, black people were more likely to be insane in the North than in the South. And then he, as scholars do, tried to decide, okay, what does this mean? Well, for him it meant slavery must be driving black people insane. I'm sorry, slavery, I'm sorry, freedom must be driving black people insane, and slavery must be good for black people. And so he decided to take this data and his analysis and publish it in, in what happened to be only the most famous and influential medical journal in the world, the New England Journal of Medicine, and he published his data and his findings in this journal. As you would imagine, especially in, in Washington today, I'm sure you could figure out what John C. Calhoun and others decided to do with that data. You see, this shows slavery is a positive good and, and, and freedom is driving black people insane. And so Edward Jarvis decided as I'm hopeful most scholars would do, to continue to study that data. And he began to find some errors. He began to see that in some northern towns, there were more black insane people than there were black residents. And he was like, okay, clearly there's something wrong here, right? And as one of the, for the founders of the American Statistical Association, he decided to get some of his colleagues to lobby Congress to investigate What's going on? Like these are critical errors, particularly in, 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 in a political time in which slaveholders are making the case that we have now statistically proven that slavery is a positive good. Uh, and so to make a long story short, the person who ended up overseeing the investigation of the 1840 census just so happened to be John C. Calhoun, who was the Secretary of State, who, as you would imagine, did a sham investigation and stated that you just don't want to accept the truth, that slavery is a positive good. Now, I, I bring up that story because it causes me as an historian, you know, and as a scholar, to ask a very simple question. Was John C. Calhoun stupid? Or was he utilizing this study to advance a political objective. Was he stupid in that he was a slaveholder? He was a slaveholder in South Carolina. In South Carolina, because of the density of black slaves, the amount of violence suffered by those black slaves was probably the most in the United States at the time. So either he just did not see this consistent brutality that maintained slavery, or he saw it recognized that it was beneficial to him and realized that he had to continuously find ways to defend it. I bring this up because I ultimately, through studying this example and many others throughout American history, I found that our common sort of idea that ignorance and hate is leading, have led to racist ideas and racist ideas have led to racist policies is not only ahistorical, but it's actually been quite the opposite. I found a history of economic, political, and, so, and, and cultural self-interest leading to the creation of racist policies and people resisting those policies, which then caused those who benefited from those policies to create and produce racist ideas that defended those policies. And they mass circulated those ideas in positions of sort of power to do so and Americans mass consume them, and their mass consumption of racist ideas has, is actually what has led to ignorance and hate. That's the sort of story that I chronicle in Stamp from the beginning. Racist policy is actually leading to racist ideas, and not the other way around as, as we've been commonly taught. And I think if some of you were to sort of think about our current moment, 
I think you could sort of begin to see how that's precisely what has been happening. To probably give one of the more obvious examples, in the realm of voting, as many of you, of course, know, you know, after the 2008 election, the Republican Party began to realize that the ideology and the demographics of the country was shifting away from them. And historically, when political parties or political groups have realized that they no longer had the votes to win, what they have attempted to do is figure out ways to suppress the votes of their opponents. So as many of you know, what ultimately led, what ultimately, I said, should say, came about that new effort to suppress voters, to suppress votes, was a whole series of measures most specifically and most popularly, the voter ID law. This voter ID law, one court stated, has targeted African-American voters with, quote, surgical precision. And, but then, particularly as a result of resistance, and particularly out of a need to justify why they're creating this law, they, of course, had to create a justification. And that justification, of course, became voter fraud, voter corruption. And if anybody is familiar with the history of American politics, particularly notions of fraud and corruption, then you're familiar with the fact that black voters from the beginning were considered fraudulent and corrupt. And the idea that black voters, and particularly black politicians, were fraud and corrupt is actually what led or what justified the, de the destruction of Reconstruction governments after the Civil War the violent and nonviolent sort of re uh, uh, death, uh, destruction of these sort of interracial governments. And so then, of course, people began to study this stuff, like Edward Jarvis did in the 1840s, to figure out, OK, is there a voter fraud problem? And some reports found that voter fraud is as, as popular as alien abduction. But still, those who benefited from this idea of voter fraud continued to push that narrative. And if anything, they stated that actually three to five million people voted illegally in the 2016 election. That voter fraud is so bad, we need to create a presidential commission to undermine it. And then you had people who consumed these ideas, who believed that there was fraud massive amounts of fraud, particularly in black voter districts. And so then they went and got their guns in the 2016 election and went to precincts in places like Philadelphia to, quote, counteract voter fraud. Like, this is the sort of what we're sort of living through. And then what happened? It, it benefited that same political party that created these voter ID laws. And some have argued that that was what was critical in the election of Donald Trump. In states like Wisconsin, where Trump won by about 20,000 votes, some estimates state that, that because of their new voter, voter ID laws and other suppression techniques, as many as 200,000 voters or votes were suppressed. So, you know, this is something we're sort of still living with. And I'm sure everybody can understand the ways in which this operates within the system of mass incarceration. But that's a longer sort of story. And so that's the sort of finding, the overarching finding that I was surprised to find, you know, in, in studying these, these producers and in studying their motives, that generally speaking, they were producing new racist ideas to justify new racist policies or to defend racist policies in their era. And, and I say this because it's critical in order to understand this thesis to understand what I'm arguing. What I'm arguing is producers and new. So the producers of racist ideas were creating these ideas to justify, I'm sorry, were creating these new racist ideas to either defend new racist policies in their era or to defend old racist policies that benefited them. Uh, and of course, you also had sort of recycling and reproducing over the course of history, which I also chronicle as well. But the driving force of history in, 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 in most sort of areas is newness, it's change. And this change was largely occurring as a result of self-interest. So what does this all sort of mean? Um, and I, 
sort of in seeing this continuous effort among very powerful and influential Americans to continuously justify the persisting disparities in the era which were coming out as a result of the persisting or new racist policies in the era has led to, has led me to also sort of reconsider how we understand America's racial history in its broadest sense. And, and, and this sort of, the racial storyline, particularly the storyline of, of black history that we're oftentimes sort of told, particularly in months like this one, goes a little something like this, that, that, that we, we being Americans, we being those who are interested in, in eliminating racism, that we have come a long way, but, but we have a ways to go. Or this idea that we, of course, have taken two steps forward and occasionally we take two steps back. And some say we're taking three steps or four steps back right now. But, but generally, this, this construct of sort of America's racial history as being this sort of march when we are sort of unpack it, we begin to see that it's understood as this sort of singular force, this singular force, this singular march of America's racial history, this singular progressive march, that, that, that things may not be, quote, perfect right now, but they're certainly better than they were a generation ago or two generations ago. Uh, and that certainly there are times in which we we are stopped or, or we're pushed back, but, but generally the arc of America's racial history is, a, is an arc of progression. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And, and, and so this theory, this historical theory, that of course is very popular, and it was even, of course, this is the sort of popular theory that, that Barack Obama continuously presented in, in his um, in his race speeches, this theory, this historical theory, I wanted to investigate it. You know, is it true? Uh, is it true, particularly as it relates to, to racist ideas? And, and, and I found that in certain ways it's true and in certain ways it's not true. What I mean by that is there actually has been a march of racial progress over the course of American history that is undeniable. But what has also been happening is there's been a second march. And that second march is racist progress. And so in other words, I, I, I sort of chronicle this history of, of racist ideas over time becoming ever more sophisticated to justify the ever more increasing sophistication of racist policies. I, I chronicle this history of, of, of anti-racist activists challenging and sometimes undermining or eliminating racist policies and those who benefited from those policies figuring out new and ever more sophisticated ways to hold people back. So in other words, breaking down barriers and those coming back and renovating them even bigger. You know, that's the sort of history that I tell, this dueling history, dueling history of, of racial progress and racist progress that allows us to sort of begin to understand how you can simultaneously have during the presidency of Barack Obama the first black presidency and Black Lives Matter simultaneously. It also gives us a sense to how it is that, that, that Donald Trump could follow Barack Obama. And, and when we begin to understand America's racial history, we begin to see that racist progress often follows racial progress. And so it actually wasn't surprising to me because for many Americans, if, if Barack Obama sort of symbolizes racial progress, then Donald Trump symbolizes racist progress. And it makes sense that Trump would then follow Barack Obama as racist progress has oftentimes followed racial progress. And so that you also sort of see that history in, in, in stand from the beginning. This sort of progress, positive and negative progress happening simultaneously. And one of the sort of ways we can understand this is the sort of Civil Rights Act of 1964. 
a, a civil rights act, which of course was the most critical and important piece of civil rights legislation in American history. A civil rights act that largely, particularly in the way in which it began to be understood in the courts, deemed legal what became known as intentional discrimination. And so those, therefore, who wanted to continue to discriminate or who benefited from discrimination, the way their racism progressed was by figuring out ways to discriminate against people in a way in which it could not be proven that that was your intent. And so people, of course, have talked about this idea of, of racism becoming more covert. I don't necessarily use terms like covert and overt to understand America's recent racial history because whenever I look at racial disparities, I'm seeing racism. And that's overt, and it's been as overt as ever. But one of the ways we can understand it using that type of sort of language is to understand in which the way in which discrimination has become privatized. In which discriminators have realized that they can't use racial language in their discriminatory policies. That they have to hide that language and that they have to use language that connotes or can target those groups of people like a voter ID law without African Americans sort of in the actual law. And so therefore, if you have a legal theory that states that racism is only racism if it can be proved as intentional, then it creates this, this, this situation in which those who want to discriminate can easily discriminate, so long as it's not in their policies and you can't find any emails <laughs> stating that they just intended to discriminate against these people. It's actually not that hard. Or what it does is those who are unconsciously discriminating. In other words, there are all sorts of racist policies that people support and defend in which they don't realize the ways in which those policies are discriminating against people. It causes them to think, okay, those policies are not discriminatory because I am not intending to discriminate against these people. Uh, and, and, and so it, 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 this is the sort of situation we're therefore living in. And, and that's how you have, despite the Civil Rights Act of 64 being passed 54 years ago, racial disparities are as pervasive as ever. Because racist policies are pervasive as ever. Finally, I wanted to sort of give you a sense in the most simplest way of the function of racist ideas historically. And, and, and I think this, it becomes critical because I, I wanted to not only sort of, sort of show this history, sort of show the impact of, of, of racist ideas on American history, show the debate between racist ideas, show the ways in which these racist ideas were coming out of racist policies, but I wanted the reader to understand in its most fundamental sense the function of racist, what are these racist ideas literally doing? And, 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 and it becomes quite simple, that racist ideas historically, and even today, suppress resistance to racial discrimination. That's what they do, and that's what they've always done. And, and when you understand it, when you understand that racial disparities, or any sort of racial disparity, whether you want to take the racial disparity of the fact that the black unemployment rate, despite it being <laughs> low, as the president continues to sort of announce, is twice as high as the white unemployment rate, and it has been so for the last 50 years consistently, there's only two explanations. Assimilationists would say a third one, but there's only two primary explanations. Either there's something wrong and inferior about black workers, that, that black workers are twice as likely to be unemployed because they're unqualified, because they're lazy, because they don't want to work, because they'd try, rather hang out on welfare, because there's something wrong with black workers, and that's why they're twice as likely to be unemployed, or job discrimination. Those are the only two explanations. And of course, assimilationists would say, actually, it's both. 
that, that yes, African Americans have experienced job discrimination and they experienced job discrimination and eventually because of that job discrimination they developed this so-called legacy of defeat in which they stop trying and stop trying to get a job. But it really comes out of discrimination. But they are, they should be trying harder. And so really it's either or both there's something wrong with black workers or job discrimination. And so when we think of any disparity, any racial disparity, those are the only two causes. And so if you have consumed and believe racist ideas, it causes you to see people as the problem as opposed to policies. That's what it causes you to do. And then you, your solutions become, okay, we need to either civilize or incarcerate or kill these people as opposed to changing and eliminating and re renovating and figuring out new and corrective policies. And so as a result, it then leads, as you see, this policy debate. <laughs> because that policy debate is based on an intellectual debate that's underlying it. Um, and, and so it also then means that if it is in fact the case that the racial groups are in fact equal, then what that means is that if racial disparities exist, they must be the result of racial discrimination. And that the job of the anti-racist is to figure out what racist policy is causing that disparity. A policy that society may be conscious of or unconscious of. And, and I say that because really when we think about then strategies to undermining racism, if, 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 if racist policies are coming out of self-interest, if racist ideas are coming out of racist policies, if ignorance and hate is coming out of racist ideas, then it causes us to readjust how we imagine we can undermine racism in American society. It causes us to realize that if we really want to undermine the production of racist ideas, it's actually quite, it's actually more effective to challenge racist policies, to challenge their cradle. And, and therefore, it, it results in really, at the most fundamental level, the struggle over race in America has been a struggle over policy and power, not ignorance and hate. And, and so if we, therefore, if groups of people who are committed to egalitarian policies, who believe that the racial groups are equal, if they go about changing policy and therefore getting positions of power to change policy, that is essentially historically how progress has came and that's how progress will continue to come. Thank you. Yes, but let me just first say, when we get to questions, wait for the microphone to reach you. Please use the microphone so everybody can hear you. It's a crowded room. Uh, and please identify yourself uh, when you speak. Uh, but first, Philippa, you've got a thank question. You. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Kendi. I want to pick up on your conclusion. In your book, uh, you talk about, as you have here, about racial discrimination being the result of economic, political, cultural self-interest. And what you are looking for is what you call intelligent self-interest, meaning people recognizing that racial discrimination does not serve the country or anybody in it very well. And so at the same time, you criticize efforts at education. Now, I understand the context that you're saying education was used to say, oh, look at how uh, black people are being treated, and if you only understood it, you would not be racist. But looking at a policy perspective, absent education about what it is that is going on, how would you see the changes in policy coming about? How would you see people understanding what intelligent <coughs> self-interest is? Sure. Of course, uh, she asked an extremely difficult question. Um, thank you so much. Uh, well, I think that first and foremost, in order, as I think people in Washington recognize, typically, uh, and I say typically because in, 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 in the last 12 months, there have been major policies uh, 
that have been enacted that the vast majority of Americans were against. But typically, when you enact a policy, you'd like to enact a policy that Americans realize are beneficial to them. And the way you, of course, go about doing that is through educating them and, and showing them that that policy uh, is beneficial to them. But really, in order to even have the capacity to educate in the context of passing policy, you, of course, have to be in a position of power, and you have to be in a position in which you recognize that the policy is actually the driving force. Well, the reason why I bring that up is because some would argue, well, let's, before we can even get in positions in which we can make these dramatic policy changes, Americans have to be mass educated away from sort of racist ideas. And that therefore goes up against people who are consistently trying to mass educate them towards racist ideas. So it becomes this sort of never ending sort of, there's, it's very difficult to sort of win that, that battle, particularly in this environment. And so that's why I sort of advocate I think, you sh I think we should be focused on educating the consumers of racist ideas, but I don't advocate the education of the producers of racist ideas. I don't advocate the education of people in positions of power, uh, particularly those who already know that the ideas that they're articulating are defensive ideas that they possibly even know are not even true. Uh, and, and so that's really the sort of difference. Um, and, and, and that's what I emphasize very quickly about intelligent self-interest. I think at the, at the end of the book, um, again, not to give it away, I try to distinguish between intelligent and unintelligent self-interest. In that historically, what, what racist ideas have done is it has caused large groups of Americans to have unintelligent self-interest in believing that racist policies were beneficial to them. And so, in other words, those, 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 those Southern, those, I should say, those, those Americans currently who have been disenfranchised by their own party's voter ID law still believe those ideas are beneficial to them. That's un unintelligent self-interest, right? Or those five million impoverished whites who, in 1860, were many of whom were believing that slavery was actually good for them or those Americans who are voting for politicians who are gonna undercut their own welfare, or who are gonna undercut uh, money for public universities and shift that away to private prisons or, or public prisons. Like, all on this basis that those, that those sort of prisons will actually make them more safe, right? And so they actually believe that. And, and so I, I, you know, I sort of show the ways in which really only a very small group of Americans have benefited from racist policies and that the vast majority of Americans simply have not. So let me use my co-chair prerogative to get the second question in. There's a lot more in this book than you were able to touch upon in the scant 50, 45 minutes uh, that we allotted for, for your talk. And so to get the full sense of the book, you have to read it. One of the themes um, that you didn't talk about here, but that's in the book, has to do with the uh, application of the term racist, uh, not to um, some of the categories that you've described here, but to various uh, individuals or groups of African Americans who themselves took a critical stance toward people of their own race in a different group. So at one point you have Marcus Garvey, um, who, who makes a brief appearance, uh, turning to blistering uh, racist ridicule when he accuses black people of being the most careless and indifferent people in the world. There's a political context for that, but that's a, a, a blistering racist ridicule that he engages in. When black voters, uh, later in the book toward the end, uh, criticize or look down upon black non-voters, um, they are targeting those non-voters with racist ideas. Or when black rank-and-file activists criticize, say, I think this is in the 1970s, uh, um, black politicians for not taking stands strong enough to address their needs, they too were engaged in kind of a racist critique of black politicians. And so the term racism becomes so ever-expansive 
that if it covers a John C. Calhoun or a Donald Trump, but also black activists criticizing black politicians for not being radical enough, um, is the term as a descriptor that useful? Um, or, well, clearly you, you, you use the term here, but I guess I'm questioning its utility for some groups whose motivations uh, and intentions are very different than either those of the out-and-out -out racists that you write about or even the assimilationists? So, I mean, it's another um, difficult question. And, and I think one of the last points that I made, I'll sort of reiterate it, and that is the function of racist ideas. So, so ultimately, I, I talked about how the function of racist ideas has historically been to suppress resistance to racial discrimination. In other words, those who have held racist ideas are people who are saying, at least as it relates to black people, that black people are the problem and not discrimination. And so when we think about it from that and then think about it from that as the core and then think about it out, we begin to see that over the course of history that black people too have told black people, no, you're the problem, not racial discrimination. And therefore, it's resulted in black people, therefore, not resisting racial discrimination and have focused their reformist efforts on civilizing and even incarcerating black people as the problem. Um, and, and, and so, and then we begin to see, therefore, that racial discrimination persists as a result. Um, and, and so, ultimately, I, in entering into the book, I did not expect to write a history that included black people saying that black people were the problem and not policies. Uh, I too believed in this prominent theory uh, that people of color, or in, in this case black people, quote, cannot be racist. Um, but again, it, it, and, and that theory therefore is based on this idea that black people don't have power and so black people can't be racist. And, and that theory, therefore, does not have, I think, a very sophisticated understanding of power in that there have been quite a few black people who have had power and have utilized that power to undermine black people as opposed to discrimination. That even black people today are refusing to hire black workers because they think black workers are lazy. But somehow when that black employer does that, that's something different than when a white employer does that. I think I, think I should also say that when I, end, when I defined a racist idea, and I think it's critical you know, when it comes to our scholarship that we do not necessarily think of the implications of definitions. Because when we think of the implications of definitions, I think it's gonna change the nature of the definition. And so for me, I was like, okay, this is how I'm gonna define it. And there, therefore, whoever comes within this banner of suggesting that there's something wrong or inferior about black people, whatever I should say idea, comes into that banner, that's a racist idea, no matter who is expressing it. Because no matter who is expressing it, it's saying that we should be focusing on those people instead of policies. And so as a result, those policies persist. I think it will also be interesting to know uh, that it's probably one of the most harmful racist ideas about black people in the 20th century was produced by a black scholar. Uh, and, and I'm referring to this theory that the black family is in ruins, that black single-headed households are pathological. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That the black family is fraud, right? And, and therefore, that is the reason why black people commit more crimes because they come from these so-called broken families. That's the reason why we should undermine welfare because these women are just having babies to get more money on welfare. This theory, this, this idea that the black family is, 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 is fraught was actually produced and popularized by uh, E. Franklin Frazier, who was a Howard sociologist who wrote a book called The Negro Family in the United States. And Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who more or less allowed this theory to become a part of policy through his uh, influential efforts in, in the Kennedy and ultimately the Johnson administrations and Nixon administration, he, in his Moynihan report in 65, continue cited E. Franklin Frazier over and over again to sort of justify his theories. And, and so we, we, you'll see this in, in Stanford in the beginning, like, whoa, I didn't realize uh, 
that that theory, which I consider to be a racist theory, uh, and when I'm saying that's what you would be saying, was actually produced by somebody who happened to be black. Gentlemen in the far back, uh, on my right side, you can hold it, the microphone is coming. Oh, and here it is. Thank you very much. I really loved your book, and hopefully I'll get an autograph. Um, my name is Golela. I'm a scholar here. I'm from South Africa. And as I read the book, I kept wondering, you know, uh, how, how the story might have developed had you taken it, you know, down that way instead of, you know, to the Americas, and, and how the ideas might have stood up or not stood up. And, and this leads me to a couple of questions. One is... Um, to what extent um, are you giving everyday white people a pass when you define racism in terms of policy? Uh, in other words, to what extent is it something that is sort of limited to the people who actually think strategically and purposively about what to do in their self-interest? Because coming from South Africa, I mean, racism basically gets to a point where it, it has an autonomy of its own, where people, without necessarily rationalizing it as being in their self-interest, uh, just act in ways, um, and that's because that's ideas that have been you know, ingrained in them, without necessarily thinking about whether it's in their economic or cultural self-interest. And, and, and finally, in South Africa, what happened is, in addition to the nurture and... and the nature and nurture differentiation. I wonder if you've thought about the, the concept of difference. What, what happened is that when apartheid became kind of like unsustainable, the whites began to talk the language of difference. No longer that, of course, inferiority was a subtext, but the idea was that, no, no, we're not against black people. It's just that they are different. They need to live in their own homelands. They need their own spaces. And I wonder whether that could fit in your framework. But I'd love to talk to you some more. Sure. So I'll answer the last question first. So that theory was actually quite prominent, particularly in, 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 in Jim Crow South, in which uh, segregationists, of course, made the case that we're separate but equal. And, 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 and the reason why we should be separate but equal is because they're fundamentally by nature different or by nature different. And so this, that, you know, that chronicle sort of that theory and I also chronicle some of the creators of this idea of separate but equal, most notably uh, an Atlanta newspaper uh, editor by the name of Henry Grady, uh, who in the 1880s popularized this theory as he was popularizing this concept of the New South, uh, a New South that, of course, would be beneficial in, in civilizing black people away from uh, slavery, just as slavery civilized black people away from Africa. Uh, in terms of the first... Um, sort of question, I, I, again, to be quite precise, I'm distinguishing between the producers and consumers. And so when I'm talking about self-interest, I'm, I'm talking about a very clear self-interest, meaning conscious self-interest. I'm talking about the producers of racist ideas. Racist ideas, and then when those people are, and then when you distinguish them from the consumers, racist ideas have been extremely effective when those who have consumed them do not even have to consciously think about their self-interest. In other words, it becomes a part of what I call their common sense. Really, the common sense of America is racist ideas. And so it, it, it's not even the sense of, you know, I, this is in my interest, like this common sense, that the reason why all those black people are in prison is because black people are more criminal-like. Right? The reason why those black neighborhoods are, are, are more impoverished is because black people don't want to save money and they don't want to work. That is sort of the common sense. And, and so it's not necessarily this case that the consumers are acting on self-interest. They're acting on these racist ideas that have more or less become their common sense. And so what I sort of show or want to want to show the consumers is that what you actually think is your common sense is actually racist ideas. And what you actually think is good for you is actually bad for you, right? Uh, and, and, and I think that's what ultimately comes across, I think, in, in reading this text and, and what has happened to Americans historically when they uh, unpack their own racist ideas. Also in the far back, there's a woman in the second to last row. Uh, 
uh, Ray Zong, the Wilson Center. Um, I wanted to ask about a media-related question. So um, when we see stories about property damage caused by post-Super Bowl Philadelphia Eagles fans versus property damage caused by uh, the aftermath of um, the death of Freddie Gray, which happened in my home state of Maryland, um, really um, the what sort of role do editors or gatekeepers of content, not necessarily the direct producers, what sort of role do they play in uh, the spread of racist ideas? Thank you. Well, I think uh, historically, I think members of the media have been very critical in that spread. I mean, you've had members of the media who, like the rest of us, were born and raised um, intellectually in a nation in which they consumed racist ideas and racist ideas became more or less their common sense and, and that's how they sort of ascertained uh, and that's how they almost flippantly uh, do what you just described, right, in terms of when there are these massive amounts of white people who are, who are happy or, or upset about something and, and they conduct and they, of course, damage property, well, that's out of their anger. <laughs> Right versus when when black people do it because they're resisting police brutality, it demonstrates that they have no sense and no understanding of of property. It demonstrates that they don't know how to you know. Of course, those things of course happen, but I should say within the media, you have people who are re reproducing racist ideas, and then you have people who are producing. And I think it's critical for us to understand the difference between those two two groups of people. So this idea of the angry white person who's letting out their anger as people normally do, and the rioter, that, that's a very sort of, the black rioter, that's a, that's a quote, old idea that really has been recycled uh, for quite some time. And I, you know, I even chronicle the reaction of the, even the term riot itself, right? Which of course has, is a term that largely has been debated. In other words, I don't describe those things as riot, I describe them as urban rebellions or rebellions, which is a different sort of thing. Maxine Waters, after the, after the LA rebellions in the early 1990s, critiqued media members for calling it a riot and stated that these people are clearly rebelling against police brutality. So it's more accurate to call it a rebellion. And so I, I bring this up because I think one of the things we begin to see is the way in which language sort of and, and the racist ideas that are baked in language, uh, in terms that are regularly used, uh, is, is, is something that I think is, is pervasive. I, to give another example, after the uh, President of the United States um, called uh, certain countries uh, curse words, uh, and uh, Americans, of course, were irate in the way he degraded those nations uh, in Africa and, and in South America, well, many of those Americans would degrade those nations by calling them developing countries. Right? But the concept that they're developing, in other words, the assimilationist idea that we can civilize them and we're civilizing them, is not considered to be a racist idea in the way that shithole is. Because, and, and, and so I, I think that, that that's a sort of another example in which sort of terms that we use every day, that I've used, um, we don't understand the sort of racist history behind those terms. Right up here in the front, second row. Philip Brenner, I'm proud to say I'm a colleague of yours at American University. Uh, so I ha we can get some sense of what you're talking about in terms of what an anti-racist uh, set of scholarship would be. Um, uh, indeed, what your last point here was the point you made in your New York Times op-ed piece um, about developing countries. Can you give us a brief summary of what, the, what a set of scholarly tasks would be that an anti-racist center would undertake? Anti-racist center or scholarship? Well, okay, I both. assume the anti-racist center is sure. supporting anti-racist scholarship. So, Let me just say a few words about that center for people who don't know. Okay, sure. Thanks. Um, so 
Of course, when I saw my colleague here, I got all nervous because who knows what he's going to say to my other colleagues back at AU. <laughs> but um, so I think first and foremost, those who have racist ideas and those who have anti-racist ideas are going to ask different questions, right? And at the basis of scholarship is the research question. Those who have racist ideas will say, what is wrong with these people? And it's my job as a scholar to figure out what is wrong with these people. Those who have anti-racist ideas will be like, the racial groups are equal. And again, I should sort of add, when, when, when I, when, an, when I say, you know, and I, I believe, when I say the racial groups are equal, I'm not saying that the racial groups are the same. I'm not saying that they're not lazy or criminal-like or violent black people. I'm saying that they're lazy, criminal-like, and violent white people too. And, and no one has ever proven definitively that there are more of one or the other. And statistics like violent crime rates in, in black communities which exclude violent crimes like drunk driving or exclude the fact that there's actually a better correlation between unemployment rates and, and violent crime than between race and violent crime um, cause us to think that the problem is those people in those neighborhoods as opposed to unemployment rates. So anyway, um, so an anti-racist would ask a different question. And that different question, of course, is, is, is what are the policies, um, what are the programs and practices that are causing these racial inequities? And, and that, I think, is the sort of guiding research question of the new anti-racist research and, and policy center at American University. And, and we're organized around sort of six different areas of, of research, uh, economics, economy, education, justice, health, and politics. And in these six areas, we we're sort of planning to ultimately sort of bring together four critical sort of professionals who've been involved historically in, in racial change, uh, in uncovering and challenging and changing racist policies. And those critical sort of four groups are scholars who typically have been critical in uncovering discriminatory policies, um, policy experts who've been critical in formulating and thinking through and developing corrective anti-racist policies, journalists who of course have been critical in disseminating research, and activists or advocates who've been critical in, 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 in literally designing campaigns of change that get these policies instituted. And so in those six areas, we're sort of focused on bringing together those four groups of people who each year, hopefully, when we raise enough money to do so, uh, will we'll essentially have a major sort of research question. Uh, we'll, and that research question will be geared to a major national and international racial inequity. That it will be their job and the job of their research teams to first and foremost figure out the, the policies, the racist policies behind that inequity or those inequities to figure out more corrective uh, policies that could actually reduce those inequities to, of course, disseminate those new policies and, and, and research findings and ultimately to design campaigns of change that got those policies instituted. So that's what we're going to be doing at the Anti-Racist Research and Policy Center. Thank you. Woman up here in the front. Second row again. Second row again. Microphone is coming. Hello, I'm Shirley Barnes. Uh, I was the U.S. ambassador to Madagascar, and um, I'm from Harlem, but have lived here in Washington for a while. My question is a concern about resegregation mm -hmm. in the education system. And to educate a child takes a long time. And what's already happened is that, um, not just in the South, but in the North, et cetera, there's an obvious resegregation or segregation in education. And I just like your comments on what to do because that takes a long time to correct. Yeah. So um, I think you're absolutely correct. And I think studies have shown the ways in which hyper uh, segregation of neighborhoods and schools uh, have, to a certain extent, in, in specific cases, increased. Uh, and of course, the historical 
the, re the historical reasons behind that, of course, when, when, when certain communities, their public schools were desegregated, either those communities relocated to other communities, those people relocated to other communities, or they created private schools uh, that excluded uh, people of color or poor people. Um, so I think in terms of solutions, I think to go back to the Brown v. Board of Education decision, uh, very briefly, the Brown v. Board of Education decision, you know, as I sort of chronicle and stand for the beginning, most people don't realize that the court actually agreed with the lower court's finding that the schools were equal or being equalized. So that wasn't the reason why they ruled segregated schools as being unconstitutional. What actually was decisive was the social science research at the time that was making the case that segregation, or I should say segregated schools, were literally making black children inferior that it was having a harmful effect on black children. Um, and it's, it's striking when you read the words of, of, of Wal Warren saying that not, not segregated schools was not having a, a bad effect on black and white children, but it was having an effect, a bad effect on black children. And so therefore we need to therefore allow black children to have access to white children so that they can therefore learn. The reason why I bring that up is because that has therefore been the basis of how we understand educational reform. That the way we reform the schools is by putting black and white bodies together, by putting as many black bodies before white bodies as possible. Now, that is coming from a more, there's two sides of that. One is coming from a more practical standpoint in which not, in which the thinker or the reformist thinks that those white bodies are superior, but they recognize the ways in which if, if, if black children in these majority white schools will have a better access to resources. But then you have others who literally think that schools or having black children by these white kids will actually be better for them, right? So ultimately, I think, I think the focus should be on equalizing the resources of schools no matter the racial makeup of those schools, as opposed to figuring out ways to desegregate schools, which clearly has failed. Um, and clearly was, as, as I sort of talk about, was based on and um, baked in racist ideas. And so, but it's very difficult for assimilationists in particular to believe that a majority black school that is equally resourced can be equal in educating its children to a majority white school. They think that's impossible. And so that's why they don't advocate for that, right? Because, the, and so, but that's one of the things that I would advocate for, the equalization of resources. But then when we talk about the equalization of resources, particularly in a society in which parents claim they enjoy a meritocracy, but they would like for their children to have all sorts of advantages and resist any efforts, <laughs> right, in actually creating a meritocracy, it becomes very politically fraught. We have a hand up over here. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you for a very, very interesting um, presentation of the frameworks in which you are working. In my own work, I look at a kind of parallel story dealing with sexism and sexist ideas and feminist scholarship and feminist ideas and activism to counteract yeah. sexism. Um, and because I've done this work for, I'm a lot older than you, um, 40, 50 years, um, I've become quite humble and recognizing uh, the complexity of identifying self-interest, what's going to work, what are the sources of sexism, therefore what to challenge, how to challenge. Um, over time, it's become not only a changing form of activism, but very confusing. Because of that, I am really interested in what you had to say about Franklin Frazier. Yeah. 
clearly it was in his self-interest to advance anti-racist policies and thinking. And he was an, a thinking intellectual activist. Would you tell us something more about the context in which he was putting forth ideas that you today, 70 years later, think of as the most important anti-race, no, the most important racist ideas of the 20th century? So, um, E. Franklin Frazier studied, or I should say received his doctoral training at the Chicago School of Urban Sociology which at the time was sort of headed by arguably the most, one of the most critical sort of assimilationists um, of the early 20th century by the name of Robert Park. And so when we think of assimilationist theory, um, Robert Park is a, a critical sort of figure in that history in which he created what he called the race relations cycle uh, which ultimately sort of talked about this idea of the quote, either immigrants or people of color, sort of first is contact, and then there's sort of uh, struggle and conflict, ultimately accommodation, and finally assimilation. Uh, and, and that sort of transition from one to the other, he considered progress. And so ultimately he encouraged uh, black people to assimilate uh, into white America. And when I say assimilate into a white America, I'm talking socially, culturally, even phenotypically. And, and so this was who E. Franklin Frazier studied under. Um, he also, E. Franklin Frazier, like many young scholars in, in the 20s and 30s, was a very keen, um, was a very keen reader of W.B. Du Bois. Uh, and W.B. Du Bois, when he was at Atlanta University in the late 1890s and early 1900s, did a series of what became known as Atlanta University studies. And one of those studies was done on the, quote, black family. And one of his findings was that the black family is pathological because it's being headed by too many uh, women. I should say that Another example of this sort of interplay or intersection of racist and sexist ideas is, of course, this theory that female-headed households are pathological when compared to what? Male-headed households, right? And so that's what E. Franklin Frazier believed. That's what Du Bois believed. And so then they looked out uh, at, at the African-American community and said they had more female-headed households than the white community, which meant their family or family structure or their family governing unit was inferior uh, to the governing structure and the, and the households in the white community. We, of course, since then, people like uh, Bell Hooks and others have, have asked very simple questions. So you're saying that two bad parents is better than one good parent? So, so you're, you're saying that actually it's, it, there are cases in which it's not better for a child if that hostile, abusive, physically abusive male is not in the household? Uh, you know, very simple sort of questions that of course weren't being asked uh, you know, at that time. Of course, we've also, we also know that if you have two parents in the household that it's more likely that you'll have more income. And I say more likely because sometimes you have men uh, in the household who are the third child of the uh, working mother. I should also mention that E. Franklin Frazier was a sociologist operating in the 30s and 40s, in which assimilationist ideas was dominant during that period. Uh, so dominant, as I stated, that it was critical uh, to the ruling of the Brown v. Board of Education uh, decision in 1954, in which scholars, I should say sociologists, were trying to figure out why haven't black people assimilated? What is wrong with them? In comparison to Italians, Irish, other groups of people, these people have not assimilated. What is going on? And assimilating, of course, was considered the virtue of being an American. We have a question back here, a woman in a gray sweater. Hello. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Kyla. I'm a PhD candidate at GW. Um, I'm grappling with this, I'm Eric's student. <laughs> I'm grappling with the notion of, I'm envisioning this as a very hierarchical, while you're describing it as a dialectical relationship between the producer and the consumer. I think just in the confines of American thought, I'm imagining these producers as wealthy elite, the slave owner, right, that wants to keep the economical, economic benefits of slavery. And I'm grappling with that in comparison to all the, you know, in the last 20 years, all the work on the grassroots racism and how whites in the suburbs or, you know, all over the country found it in their interest and kind of created their own identities around racism at the grassroots. Mm -hmm. How do you conceive, when you're thinking of producers, what is the relationship between the grassroots who might not, who might also be creators of this, right, and not just consumers? How do you see this kind of, do you see the production moving almost back and forth sometimes? Or is it almost always a power dynamic, if that makes sense? Of course, your student will ask a difficult question, right? Um, so I think that generally in, in, in STEM from the beginning, most of the producers are in fact people who have platforms um, and, and people who are in positions of power uh, and people who have the ability to reach many people with their ideas. And but in the context, I think, of the last 20 years, I think I would sort of want to, it seems to me that many of these grassroots efforts were largely, or some of them were largely derived from an intellectual standpoint by the very effort of places in Washington and other places in which you had these massive and massively power think tanks that were constantly sort of dishing out these ideas, particularly to, to white Americans. Uh, and then that was causing then people to have these ideas and organize around them, right? And then of course, when they organized around them and consumed them, they probably changed them to fit their own specific experience to mold it to presumably sort of galvanize and organize people in their specific environment. But the seed of that idea that, eventually, that of course blossomed presumably in different ways depending on the community, I would argue largely came out of those producers. Uh, and those producers typically were quite elite. That, now that's not to say that all of the producers of, of, of racist or even anti-racist ideas uh, have been very powerful, wealthy, elite people. Uh, there are instances in the text in which people who are not in that category produce racist ideas that go, in, in our terms, viral, right? And, and so that certainly happens and even, of course, happens today more likely because of the, the power of social media. We could go on, I think, for many hours more, but it's now, unfortunately, time to draw this to a close. I want to invite you all to a light reception outside this room, remind you that on February 12th, next week, Andrew Demshuk is speaking on a slightly different subject, Demolition on Karl Marx Square, Cultural Barbarism and the People's State in 1968. Uh, thank you to our participants, and thank you to Professor Kendi. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I get the first signature before you get inundated by others. <laughs>